started. Uh, and I'll get started with this wonderful webinar we have set up for you guys today. So um, thank you for joining today for Sacred Water and Interfaith Conversation. My name is Chinit and I'm the Sustainability um, Intern at Faith in the Common Good. I'm your host for this evening. Um, so this year we started a Climate Narratives Project. It is a national interfaith webinar campaign series that works closely with Canadian and global faith and spiritual based environmental partners to raise awareness about the numerous climate challenges and inspire Canadians to take action in their communities. Today's webinar is the second webinar in the series and is generously funded by the Clean Economy Fund. If you are interested in watching our first webinar in the series, Taking Action on Climate Change that happened on World Interfaith Harmony Week, please visit our YouTube channel. And uh, just before we begin our webinar today, I have a few housekeeping notes. We'd love to hear from you. And my colleague Beatrice will be moderating the chat this evening. So if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat window. We'll address them during the Q&A session at the end as time permits. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel when it becomes available. We will share it to you um, through an email along with any resources mentioned in today's webinar. Next slide, please. Oh no, I'm doing the slide, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am a person, okay, next slide. Um, um, so for those of you just joining us, welcome. We are gathered today to have a conversation to learn about what diverse faith and spiritual traditions have to teach us concerning the sacredness of water in a time of climate crisis and how we can deepen our connection with it. The conversation will include guest speaker Marianne Kabios, Kabiosi, uh, an Anishinaabe water walker, Dr. Romila Verma, founding director at Water Speaks and lecturer at the University of Toronto, and Sapinder Karbini, a decolonization consultant. Um, so after listening to our guest speakers talk, we will have a panel discussion where all the guest speakers will have an opportunity to reflect on a few questions. After our panel discussion, we break out into smaller groups. Um, so this is an opportunity for everyone to join the conversation and share and reflect on what um, does water mean to you and what does your respective religion, culture, or spiritual tradition teach you about the sacredness of water and how we can connect more deeply with it to be better stewards of the environment. Lastly, before we wrap up for today's uh, webinar, FCG will be sharing some resources that you can start including at your home, at place of worship, and even within your community. But most importantly, we hope today's conversation deepens everyone's connection with water and protect it forever. I would now like to welcome Faith in the Common Good Executive Director, Michelle Singh, to, bring, to begin the webinar with a land acknowledgement and introductions. Thank you, Shanit, and welcome everyone. I see there are still people coming into the room. So I'm um, going to speak slowly as, uh, and welcome everyone in. We were to take a moment to acknowledge that we are a collaboration of organizations from coast to coast to coast on the traditional ceded and unceded territories of diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. These nations live in a deep reciprocal relationship with not only the land and the waterways, but also with the physical and spiritual forces that connect them to their place of creation in an intimate and meaningful way. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, work, and thrive together. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to work towards reconciliation on many levels. Now, to learn more about whose traditional territory you are on, we invite you to visit www.native-land.ca. Next slide, please. Thank you, Shanit. I just want to take a couple of minutes now to share with you a little bit more about faith in the common good. 
We are a national interfaith charitable network that was founded in 2000, dedicated to assisting and inspiring religious congregations and spiritual groups of all backgrounds to take collective action in creating more resilient and sustainable communities. And we do that by harnessing the power of diverse faith and spiritual groups through education, capacity building, and collective action. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge one of our founders, the very Reverend Dr. Bill Phipps, who recently passed away. From Faith and the Common Goods Inception, Bill recognized the diversity of Canadian religious and cultural perspectives and the need to find practical ways to work together on common good projects. He was a passionate and impassioned social and environmental justice advocate. In 1998, um, on behalf of the United Church, Bill issued the first Canadian apology to First Nations survivors, their families and communities for the harms done by the church at the residential schools that the church helped run. Bill was always a bridge builder. He was always looking for ways to bring diverse groups together for the common good through interfaith initiatives. We are deeply, deeply grateful for his passion, his commitment, his leadership, and we are also deeply honored that we all have the opportunity to continue his work. I just want to take another moment to um, tell you about some of our current projects. You can learn more at our website, and I believe Beatrice is going to add that link um, to the chat box. Greeting Sacred Spaces, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is our longest running program. And it connects uh, faith groups with local nonprofit, municipal, and commercial organizations. It's a very practical program. GSS assists faith communities with both the educational and spiritual dimensions of greening, as well as the, the how-to side of audits, retrofits, and generally reducing a faith community's footprints. I see that there are some folks here from the United Church you're probably all aware of the Faithful Footprints program, which is a United Church program that Faith in the Common Good is delivering. The United Church has made a commitment to reducing their emissions 80% by 2050, and the Faithful Footprints program is a five-year program, the only one of its kind in Canada, that seeks to engage uh, at least 500 congregations by 2025, work with them to, uh, on building energy efficiency to help lower their carbon uh, footprint. Another of the programs underneath our umbrella is Movement Laudato Si Movement, which is working with Catholics across Canada to respond to Pope Francis's urgent call for social political and ecological transformation, and to animate the insights articulated in Laudato Si. Recently, we launched the Catholic Eco Accelerator Investment Toolkit for faith-based institutions concerned with how their investments align with their mission and vision, particularly in light of our current global climate crisis. This toolkit is available on our website to all faith communities. The Greening Canadian Mosque program in partnership with Envira Muslims also has a toolkit for Canadian imams and mosque management teams to embed sustainable practices within their facilities and engage with their local communities. Resources in that toolkit are available in seven languages and is, um, you could also access that through our website. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon, evening. Thank you, Michelle, for the introductions. Um, so let's jump into today's webinar's purpose. I'm excited to let you know that we are gathered on World Water Day, which is held annually on March 22nd, to remind people about the significance of freshwater to our planet. Water is life. 
It is hydration, habitat, and health. Many faiths and spiritualities teach us to reserve this resource, to give thanks when it's abundant, and to cherish it when it's scarce. Today, water is under extreme threat from the worsening impacts of climate change. Millions of people around the world, including Canadians and First Nations communities in Canada, lack adequate access to one of the essential elements of life, clean water. At the same time, floods and droughts are becoming more frequent and extreme as the climate crisis deepens. World Water Day is an opportunity to reflect upon these realities. Today's conversation is an invitation, a call to action, and an opportunity for our community to collectively join together to listen to our guest speakers and peers, learn from each other, and most importantly, act together on climate change for a healthy, just, and sustainable future. Today's topic is about sacredness of water. Water means different things to different people. In religious and spiritual spaces, water can mean a connection with creation, community, and oneself. Sacred water is an opportunity to hear from different perspectives about the many ways water is sacred and gain an understanding on how we can value, pro how we can value water properly and protect it for everyone. Today, we have invited three amazing guest speakers from different faiths and spiritualities to share with us what their faith and spiritual traditions have to teach us concerning the importance of water and how we can deepen our connection with it. I would now like to welcome our first guest speaker, Marianne Kapiasi. Marianne is an Ojibwe Anishinaabe of the Bear Khan from the we come, come unceded territory where her ancestors walked. She is an artist, a water walker, and a PhD candidate in Indigenous Studies at Trent University. She's been gifted water walk teachings and protocols from the late Josephine Madman and continues her work towards the water by walking for, praying for, and helping others connect with the spirit of the water, she who gives us life. In 2001, Marianne finished the last of the four ceremonial commitments for the Grand River by leading Indigenous and non-Indigenous walks by the All Nation Grand River, which began in 2018. Um, I would like to welcome Marianne to come and speak. Thank you. Bonjour, everyone. It's nice to see you all and to, uh, to hear that you're uh, available to be here in spirit and, and to hear our teachings. So I'm really happy to, to tell you that uh, on the weekend, we were actually much in spirit for the water as we gathered down by the Grand River near Cambridge, Ontario. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. And uh, so I just wanted to, uh, to tell you that how, how, how fulfilling that was. And we had everyone, um, there were about 25 of us that gathered, uh, settler and uh, indigenous alike, uh, those from the uh, faith groups and those from other uh, perspectives, men and women and children. And it was so satisfying to do that work. And this is one of those uh, pieces of work that I, that I continue uh, in Josephine Baugh's, uh, her request that we continue the water ceremonies. And at those water ceremonies, what we do is we, we go down to the water, we talk to her, we look at her, we pray to her, we sing to her. And uh, this teaching that uh, Josephine Baugh told us was that the water is like us when we don't feel well, that we, love to be held, that we love to be looked at, sung to, and prayed to. And so when we know that, that, that sensation of being loved and respected and honored, uh, we know that feeling. And Josephine Baugh said, that's how the water feels. That's how she feels, because she is alive. She has spirit as we have spirit. And so that water walk that we do is also a ceremony. It's not just a walk. And so when I started that walk for the Grand River in 2018, Josephine Bob was, uh, was my guide. She uh, instructed me and uh, she, she gave me some very good teachings. And one of the first ones was that 
as I began that journey of collecting people, bringing people together, I, I had a lot of non-Indigenous uh, people working with me. And I asked Josephine Ba, I told her uh, that most of the people that were helping, I said, were settlers, were allied settlers. And she said, that's good, Marianne. That's very good because we all use water. Everyone uses water. We all drink water. We clean with the water. We use water. And we're all made up of water. And so everyone has that responsibility to do that work. And so I was delighted because part of what I vi visioned was to bring all nations to the water because we do all use her. And uh, that our Anishinaabeg people, we know the teachings about the water. And I believed and still believe that many of us are disconnected from the water. We don't understand how important she is to us, to us and to creation. Because creation is also a big part of, uh, of our world. And when we do that water walk and those water ceremonies, we come to understand that all of creation relies on her. All of the we beings, all of the, all of the bird life, the winged we call them, all of the swimmers with the fish, the turtles, the snakes, all of the, the otters and all of the other beings, the herons, the cranes, they all stand next to the water and they feed next to her and they live there. The geese and the ducks have their nests in the water. And the medicines that, that line those uh, waterways, the streams, the rivers, the lakes, they're all medicines. And so we know that we understand that relationship that everything needs water. Everything is made up of water and the trees and ev everything, everything relies on water and everything, every being has a spirit. And uh, when we do that work for the water walk, we start early in the morning. And at that time, this is when everything comes to life at sunrise. That's when we hear all of the birds, when we hear all the little mosquitoes and the flies and the bees, the wasps, everything comes to life in the morning. And so that time of connecting to creation is really important. And then we start seeing the stars going out because when we're walking at three in the morning, the stars are just light up the sky. It's beautiful, like diamonds. And then the sky starts to get bright. And when the, the sky starts to get bright, then the colors of the sky change. And not many people get to see that change in the color of the sky realm because we're tucked in our beds or we're starting to get ready for work and we don't, we don't witness that. And it's a very uplifting, it's a very healing time for us but it's also a healing, uplifting time for creation because we are not alone here. All of those beings on the land are our relatives. We're related to them and, and they help us. And it's our responsibility as Anishinaabe people and as two-legged beings to help all of those beings because they help the water, the water helps them and, and we help by being, by, by praying for, by connecting to the water, by doing all of that work for her. And so that this weekend, when I stood there and saw all the people coming, the, the different faith groups and the, and the men came and the children, and we all stood there and did that beautiful work. It was very spiritual. And the, and the people that came were talking to me and they were so happy. You could see their faces were just glowing. And, and this happens, and, and this uh, happens during the water walk as well as the water ceremony. The water ceremony is a special, maybe a, an hour and a half connecting to the water. The water walk can be a week long, two weeks long, depending on which waterways we're, we're uh, walking for, we're being in ceremony for. And so, um, and that's, that's what I want to share. I don't know how much time I have left. Um, Marianne, you have a couple more minutes if you want to finish up. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And, and so um, I was going to add that in our teachings, our Anishinaabeg ways, 
the, the women are responsible for the water because we're the ones uh, who give birth. And when we give birth, our waters break. So we're in our mother's womb for nine months. We're in water when we're being born, when we're being held by our mothers. And so when we think about that, how do we treat our water? Uh, our mothers are taking care of us. They're feeling, they're seeing, they're hearing. And all of that water that we are laying in until we come through that her channel, we feel everything. And the water is like that too, the waterways. We see the water as, a, as the veins of Mother Earth. That's her lifeblood, is that water. Whether it's a puddle, a stream, uh, a, a river, uh, a lake, the ocean. And all the waters that come down. Yesterday we drove through fog and then we drove through snow and then we, we drove through rain. And then the winter it was sleet and then it was snow and it was freezing rain. It's all nibby. We say nibby for water. It's all water and she is sacred. And it's when, we, when you walk to her, you feel good. When you feel troubled, we always say, go to the water, go. She will help you. She will help you heal and help you to cry and help you to, to do your good healing within and find peace. So that's, uh, that's what I want to, to share with you overall. And we all have that responsibility to love the water because we're made up of water. So Jimmy Gwetch, thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for, the, uh, for sharing with us today um, and your time with us. Very much appreciated. Um, I would now like to, I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. And I would like to welcome our um, next uh, guest speaker is Dr. Ramila Verma, who is a teacher, researcher, speaker, artist, and documentary filmmaker. Dr. Verma also lectures on water and environmental issues at the University of Toronto. Her experience growing up with resource inequality in India fueled her desire to educate re research and find creative solutions to global challenges like freshwater shortages and climate change impacts. Her documentary, Water Be Dam, narrates a compelling journey of river uh, Satlung in Punjab, India, by tracing the story of challenges, hopes, and aspirations of waters will to survive and rejuvenate. She is the founder of Water Speaks, an initiative that strives to translate the voice of water through research, education, and action. She leads educational workshops for elementary and middle school students through the concepts of STEM. I will now like to welcome um, Dr. Ramila Verma. Thank you, Chanit, for that amazing introduction. And thank you uh, to Faith and the Common Good uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk about water on uh, World Water Day. So this is a privilege for me. So thank you and welcome to everybody. Um, so as Chanit said, I um, grew up in India in the Indo-Gangetic plain, the river Ganges or Ganga. So my spiritual uh, connection to that area is very deep. Uh, and it was nurtured through the thousand years of Vedic philosophy and history of the region. Uh, and uh, uh, my faith uh, in water, in nature, in the five elements, and as Marian also uh, was talking about it, uh, the, the spirituality, the connection we have to water is ab absolutely immense. And then eventually I navigated my way through that into academia and wanted to know more about water because of the few things that I saw, the sheer inequity, the fact that there were people and especially young kids dying of diarrhea uh, as I was growing up um, uh, in, in a city called Kolkata, or it was called Calcutta. So that channelized my interest and, and energy towards trying to understand why this discrepancy, uh, things like diarrhea or jaundice was so prevalent. So I went into um, uh, my PhD with hydrology and started uh, 
trying to look for resources, trying to look for, for um, uh, any kind of solutions to address these inequities. So I'm going to share my screen. I have some um, slides. Uh, once a teacher, always a teacher. So I, I think I'm going to just sh uh, show you a little snippet of um, about water and what it means to me and uh, what we can do uh, to, to ensure that we have abundance of water for everyone around the world. So, um, Sorry about that. I should go back to the first slide. So everybody can see, Chanit, can you uh, make sure that everybody's yes. seeing this slide? Okay. Um, so uh, today I'm just going to give you a brief context about freshwater challenges. Uh, in our uh, uh, in our planet, and I'm going to talk about my research on on providing solutions through the four pillars of water sustainability. And I know we are not taking questions right now, but that's um, I will actually show you uh, two very short uh, videos. One is my, my documentary preview. And the other is a Trans Africa pipeline. So water pipeline. So let me just clarify it quickly before you <laughs> before you think it's an oil it's a oil pipeline. It's not. It's a water pipeline. So I, I want to give you some context. But before that, I love this image. Uh, it's a, a NASA uh, satellite based image that shows you water. It's movement, how you see the clouds moving, it's the moisture moving throughout the world and the oceanic currents that you can't see here. But, but this is it, this is climate guys, right? Climate is nothing but movement of water from one place to another. Lack of water or flooding, everything is related to, uh, to, to water and that's what defines climate. So you can see this is over the winter months of I think 20, so this shows you the, the importance and the fragility of our system, the hydrological system, as we call it. And when we talk about climate, this is something that I feel that we do not talk about hydrological cycle enough, that this is all about the movement of water. So this brings us to what are the challenges that we see around us? So we definitely see supply limitations. So this, this image that you see on top here, it's Aral Sea. So I am not very sure if you are aware of Aral Sea in, in Central Asia. It used to be one of the, uh, the fourth largest lakes in the world. And this is what it is now. It has shrunk to this nothingness. And it has created all kinds of uh, difficult situations for people in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. This is the same story everywhere. We do not have unlimited supplies. Less than 3% of our world's water is fresh water. And then the next thing is, besides supply limitation, we have increasing demands. Um, that has been increasing since, I guess, uh, post-World War II, as, as the world started to redefine development, the Green Revolution, Industrial Revolution, the second round of Industrial Revolution, uh, increase in population, increase the demands. And then there is climate change impacts. Everywhere we'll see, we are seeing glaciers melting, we are seeing flooding, severe weather events. And then another thing with water, especially with drinking water, is high capital investment. Cleaning water, supplying water, piping it. It, it is not cheap. It is a very expensive thing. So that's another challenge that we face. And we see pollution and contamination uh, around the world. And right here in Canada, indigenous communities are still, are, are still not guaranteed fresh water or clean water. Uh, and then inequitable access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Billion people do not have access to sanitation. Close to billion people do not have access to piped water, safe drinking water, where women are then responsible and girls to walk and collect water for their families. 
And then another thing that, that I would want to uh, add in this list is we never talk about regeneration of water for ecosystem provisioning. That it's water is a provider for our ecosystem. So how can we ensure that we uh, actually take into account that we have lack of that regeneration process that our nature needs? And I can um, give you an example of Wanganui River in New Zealand, which was declared a living entity. Isn't that beautiful? Of course, the legalities, the, the policies and the, and the legal aspect is a little bit challenging, but it was declared in 2017 a living entity, entity by the indigenous Maui tribe of New Zealand. They have been pushing for it for 100 years. So that's, these are some of the things that are posing a huge challenge. So then, what can we do? So what I, I uh, the, my research shows that we have to use a sustained four pillar approach of water sustainability. So what you will see here in the pillar that if you are trying to establish a water tank in a very unstable, wobbly, where the each of the pillars one is absolutely this, it's not even discussed. One is short, one is long, one is strong, one is weak. That water tank is going to collapse eventually. So what are these four, four pillars? The, the first and the foundational pillar is the spirituality and cultural or philosophical aspect of water that has never been in, integrated into our policy framework. The second is science and technology. And the third is the demand, supply, and finance, which is by far the strongest pillar, the economy, the management, uh, not the management, the, the, the supply and demand, water as a resource is the strongest pillar. And then management and governance is still a very weak pillar around the world. So uh, looking at each of these pillars, when we say spirituality and culture of water, what do you mean by that? What would that entail? And what kind of uh, thinking it will bring into our policy papers. It will bring the ethical aspect, the equity and ownership. Who should own water? Should water be owned? Should it be privatized? Should it be public? Then we also talk about the intrinsic value to ecosystem. So we, we have been looking at water at such a narrow lens, uh, all feeding into the whole su supply demand system of our economy. So each last drop is coaxed to feed the human uh, uh, needs. Uh, so when we talk about spirituality, culture, and philosophy of water, we have to look at the intrinsic value that it brings to the ecosystem, the spiritual connection that we have with water. Chances are you ask anybody around the world, doesn't matter where they are from, uh, water becomes such a connector for them. Do you close your eyes, whether you, we, you are from any part of the world, you are obviously connected to it directly. And then rights of water bodies. I talk about the Wanganui river system. Now, the second pillar is science and technology that our understanding of hydrological cycle, our understanding of, of contamination, source protection, the impacts of climate change, all these uh, scientific uh, research that is required to ensure that we are feeding the first pillar properly. And then obviously the technology, water treatment and supply, that's what technology is focused on. But we are moving away from, from that by bringing in rainwater harvesting, regeneration of groundwater and other systems into this thinking. And then the third pillar, the so strongest pillar is demand, supply and finance. So different water sectors like municip municipal, agriculture, industry, energy, transportation, recreation, all these are basically having this intersectoral competition for that very limited amount of water. They are all fighting for that water, right? So that is a very strong pillar because it's all based on demand and supply. And who finances it? Again, public versus private debate comes in. Should it be a private entity? Should it be privatized? Should it be a commodity? Should it be an economic good? 
So how do we paraphrase or how we, we look at water? What kind of paradigm we, we, we uh, come up with says a lot about the lack of water and water crisis that we are seeing. And the final pillar is the management and governance. So, so far what we have seen uh, due to industrial revolution, um, we have seen that we are very focused on supply side management, where you say, okay, here's the demand, here's the supply, go. We have never thought about, you know, what are the impacts of damming these river systems of bifurcation of bulk water transfer. Uh, 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 no uh, input about conservation, right? So, so that was um, uh, supply side and it's still very much the, uh, I guess, overarching uh, system that takes care of water management. And then we moved in 1970s to demand side saying, wait a minute, we don't have enough. So let's then incorporate uh, pricing. Let people pay for, for water, not give them for this $10 and then uh, flat rate, and then you go and use as much as you can. And then there's a so soft path approach and integrated watershed management approach that is gaining a lot of importance where we say we are going to make sure that we are leaving water for the future generation in a better uh, volume, in a better condition. So those are some of the things. And then we talk about governance, the policies, legislations, and laws that we need to create uh, to ensure that all these pillars are strong and communicating with each other. So now I want to quickly show you- um, Ramila. Yeah? I am going to um, ask you to end on that note. Okay. Because we are over time. Sure. And perhaps what we can do is have you share the links for the videos in the yeah. chat. Um, and uh, maybe later on in the program, we could come back to them if we're able. Okay. To show, and it's a one minute quick preview that I can show you either later. And I'll uh, maybe uh, put that in the chat so people can Thank go you. and take a look at that. Uh, so th that's, that was it though. That's my uh, presentation for today and um, uh, hoping to connect with you guys in separate groups. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramila, for the presentation. Um, we will just start sharing my screen. And our next guest speaker is um, Siklinder Carvening. Um, she joins us from Vancouver, British Columbia. She is a decolonization consultant and also a new FCG board member. She works with decision makers and corporations, organizations, and governments to build cultural cultures of equity and respect with diverse colleagues, staff, clients, and stakeholders. She is passionate about decolonization and societal systems and is working on developing non-colonial systems and relationships with Indigenous communities. She's working on how to respond to climate change in a non-colonial way and create measurable change and brings an extensive interfaith background to her work. Um, just want to welcome um, Sukhinder. Thank you. Thank you. So my contribution for today um, has to do with um, my work anyways in climate change focuses on decolonization. And when it comes to water, what I'd like to share is how can we advocate for water from a non-colonial perspective? So from a perspective of self-determination, so over the last 20 years, I have to say, I've been witnessing the climate change movement changing uh, in Vancouver. And I saw it go from like a really strong movement of positive transformation uh, to a more colonial, uh, like more colonial tactics, I want to say, entering and um, shaping the movement. And so we have a movement that has a lot of good people, right? And um, however, though, they're coming in with colonial mindsets and behaviors. And so it used to be like, oh, you just got to be a good person. And I have to say, I feel like it's not enough to be good. I want to instead invite you um, to practice self-determination, right? That's the process by which we control and take responsibility for how we show up and don't show up. It originates within ourselves and it flows outwards. So self-determination requires the cultivation of certain habits. Uh, we need to be self-aware. 
We need to be in candid relationship with ourselves. Lying to ourselves makes self-determination impossible. We need to practice self-acceptance, where we accept both the parts we like about ourselves and the parts we don't like. Denial of ourselves makes self-determination impossible. We need self-respect. It doesn't work if we don't respect ourselves, yet we demand respect from others. It means we can get very easily triggered. And we need responsibility. The buck has to stop with us. We can't do victim Olympics. We have to be okay with making mistakes and we have to be okay with being wrong. It's how we figure out what doesn't work, which is so important, right? When we're in a time of change and um, figuring out new solutions and we need self-control. Lack of self-control makes self-determination impossible. So while we talk about you know, colonial habits and mindsets and all that, um, and we talk about colonialism, I find I struggle with our framework of colonialism. So I wanna share with you and invite you to consider that colonialism is not a European thing. Every human history has a history of being colonized and being the colonizer. Colonialism is not specific to Europe. We human beings have been colonizing each other for thousands of years. I mean, my own spiritual path, Sikhi, it began as a response to the colonization of the Indian subcontinent by the Mughals. They were not Europeans. So our skin color, it doesn't determine who's the colonizer. The reality is we all have colonial habits that we have grown up with. And so coming from self-determination and coming from um, this idea that we're all part of colonialism and starting that it's a human journey that we are on together. That's where I wanna start talking to you about sacredness of water and talk to you about the term sacredness and how colonial tactics or colonial mindsets have overtaken that term. Sacredness from a spiritual perspective is a relationship with ourselves. So it's the sacredness of water, our relationship, our individual relationship with water. How do we center ourselves? How does that relationship help us um, stay you know, um, on a path that is one of protecting it and taking care of it? It's a personal thing. And I'm gonna invite you to consider that the habit of this is sacred. <gasps> You're a bad person if you don't believe in the same sacredness that that comes actually from colonial habits. It's about framing the work in a way that says this thinking is the right thinking and your thinking is wrong. So we who think right and we know best, because that's where the savior complex comes from. And again, there's no such thing as white savior complex people. There is a human savior complex. Again, we all do it from all our different cultures. We're going to save people whether they want to or not. And it comes from a place of ego, of having the answers, of knowing what's best. And so we're going to then impose that on other people. That's part of colonialism. Those are one of those colonial habits. It's about establishing who's right and who's wrong. And if you just think back, like if you come from, you know, anywhere that's been colonized, think of what the colonizer said. They basically said, if you're the indigenous peoples of those lands and all of us are indigenous peoples of somewhere, the colonizer said our way of life was wrong, theirs was right. So they had the power and the authority to overtake us. And it was our job to conform to them. The other thing that happens is when we talk about sacredness and teachings, right? When we go to our teachings and we look for the relationship with water, we look for, um, the, you know, regarding sacred teachings. I want to say to you that the self-determination path is one where we go to those teachings with the mindset to be empowered, to be inspired, to, to deal with our struggles and figure out a way forward. That is that, re that relationship of sacredness. The colonial mindset is one that goes, oh, look, I found a passage. I now have authority. Let me thump you over your head with it. And we do this from all traditions. So I know we talk about Bible thumping. Really, it's sacred text thumping. This is what we do. And it's, again, those habits, it kind of makes sense of, because the, the colonial mindset is that the authority we have of, our, of ourselves is external. It's got to be something outside. Whereas I want to say to you, self-determination says, well, our authority is from within. 
because it comes from responsibility. It comes from owning ourselves. It comes from being authentic. It comes from showing up and being courageous. So shifting that, right? Looking at that. And so when we talk about the sacredness of water, we can accidentally, sometimes with the best of intentions, use our teachings that talk about the sacredness of water to sit there and impose that on someone else who might have a different belief around it, whose tradition might speak about it in a different context, or someone who maybe they don't have a spiritual tradition, but yet they believe in the essence of water, they just come at it from a different way. So that it ends up being we lack diversity. We struggle with diversity at that point, because we don't know how to relate to someone who's coming at you know, that water's important from a different perspective. Another thing that happens is um, the shaming, right? So when we're putting in the framework is one of, this is the right way to think. This is, um, I'm right, you're wrong. Um, and you need to obey this because it's sacred and it's, it's the right way to do things. We encourage obedience. We don't encourage understanding and we really, really use the colonial tactic of shaming. That one I wanna say, like we use it in our families, people. <laughs> it's everywhere around us and it's one that we really do need to shift because it is not, um, self-determination isn't possible, but can I say, I don't think actual transformation is possible when we're busy you know, smearing people with shame and asking them to obey rather than them coming into the truth and figuring it out and being proactive and um, being their authentic selves. So the other piece is that um, when we talk about water, um, there is the spiritual side of it and then I want to say we struggle sometimes of looking at it from these other diverse um, perspectives. And yet, if we could learn the languages of the different types of human beings that are out there, and I'm not talking about linguistics of, you know, from different cultures, I'm talking about how we think. There are those that are going to approach it really from a spiritual perspective. Others are going to approach it, though, from, well, this is for future generations. You know, maybe I'm not so spiritual and I don't quite get the woo-woo stuff, but yeah, I want something for my my grandchildren and children, and I and and I want to leave this world better than the one that I inherited. And so they can come at it from a place of responsibility. Others come at it from, well, yeah, it's like we all drink it; it's essential. I don't know about the spiritual part or the sacredness, but it is essential. And so we use these different words, yet we're all heading in the different in the same sorry um, direction. And I find my observation has been is we get stuck on the differences and arguing over what the right words should be rather than saying, hey, I'm really good at the spiritual side. Wow, you're really good at sort of getting people to understand how essential it is. And wow, you're really good at getting people to realize that we want to leave something better for future generations. What if we work together? Right? So self-determination, collaboration, partnerships. This is this is that healthy part. This is what we need to be doing. Um, and I, I mean, I don't have to say, I want to say that there's many of you, I know you're already doing this kind of work. And so what I want to say is, listen, we're all human beings. And while there are fragile human beings, again, white fragility, very racist concept. I just want to say that, um, there's human fragility and some humans are fragile, but the reality is most of us, we have moments of fragility. Right. So if we can be self-accepting of just who we are, of, hey, I can be fragile sometimes. Mm, I can kind of, you know, lose my way. And then how do we figure out? That's what self-determination is about, is how do I figure my way back? How do I, you know, get back to center? And can I, you know, give myself grace to move forward and learn and change the habits? It's not about doing the same mistake over and over again. So what I want to just summarize with is... Um, Self-determination, if we can, I invite you to use that as a tool uh, to be uh, the opposite of colonization. Thank you. Thank you, Sukhvinder, for that. Um, thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you for your time. Um, we will now begin the panel discussion. I'm just going to share the questions. There you go. So our panel discussion um, is going to be uh, with our guest speakers and taking a moment to reflect on um, these questions and share the responses with all of us. So the question is, what does your respect to religion, culture, or spiritual tradition teach you about the sacredness of water? And how can we connect more deeply with it to be better stewards of the environment? I would like to um, 
invite guest speaker Mary Ann to begin this conversation. Um, Mary Ann, um, how, what's it called? How can we be better stewards of this environment? Um, I'm just thinking of uh, our philosophies, Anishinaabeg philosophies. And uh, according to our teachings, and I mentioned it briefly in the, uh, my, my introduction is that uh, we see everything on the earth as our relatives. And so uh, if you think about that and you have a responsibility, so we believe in respect, responsibility and reciprocity. So in that way, we give, we give back as opposed to just taking something. We give back to our relatives and we find ways to protect our relatives. And, and so we believe that the, they are sacred beings, sacred in, that, in the sense that they have spirit like we do and that, um, that life was given from a higher power, that creator. And so when we say sacred, it's because it was given life. It has a spirit. And so when we think of that responsibility, and it's like taking, we only take what we need. When we, when we fish, when we hunt, we just take what we need. When we harvest medicines for the people, we only take what we need. And then we give back by offering tobacco, by offering uh, ceremonies and rituals for those, for those plants, for those seeds. We have ceremonies for seeds. We have ceremonies for the water. We have ceremonies for different times of the year, full moon ceremonies to honor the water. We have those, those times when we honor the earth. And we, do, we think of that, and I like that you mentioned the next generations because that's, that is our, our, our perspective is down to you know, our, our grandchildren and, and grandparents. So that's how we see that. Uh, uh, we take care of it that way. And when we try to help other people, we try to just let them see this is how we do it. This is how we do it. And uh, what, what we've done in, in terms of um, the future generations. Thank you, Marianne. I really like the part where you said to take what you need and just to leave the rest. And I think that's an important practice to incorporate into our everyday lives with, um, with water. Um, Romila, do you have anything else to add to this uh, panel discussion? Um, yes. Um, and I, I, I want to talk about um, the, the uh, what Marianne was saying is just resonates with me so much. And everything that she was saying is that, okay, the, they're taking it from the Vedic indigenous philosophy, and there's a Sanskrit hymn, if I may quote, Mata, Mata Bhumi Putroham Prithvime, Prith, Prithviye. So that quote means that Mother Earth, she is my mother, and I am uh, her son. So I am going to be a bit tongue in cheek here. Maybe a, <laughs> a man wrote this him. So by son, it means we are her children, right? So that that quote that we are her children and she has enshrined us or entrusted us to take care of her. So what I, um, for me personally, uh, my uh, philosophy, my connection to nature relies a lot on folklore. So uh, growing up, we had we would hear stories about some amazing, uh, you know, it had ideas, it, it it had philosophy, it had wisdom, and it was entertaining as children to know how River Ganges or the Ganga River came to the Himalayas was very interesting and fascinating. She apparently used to flow in the moon and she was very lonely there and her only companion was Shiva. So he was one of the three, the, the, the three major gods, Shiva, who used to be her companion. So at that time, uh, the, 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 the Northern part of India was facing drought, severe drought. So uh, King Bhagirat, uh, he was, uh, everybody went to him saying this, we need water, we are all dying. So he performed a very difficult penance in the Himalayas and he invoked Ganga to come and flow in the, uh, uh, on earth and she wouldn't. She said, I've never ever gone beyond the moon. How would I jump down to earth and, and flow somewhere which is so, uh, uh, you know, I'm not strange and not, I'm not familiar. So Shiva actually encourages her, say, I'll go there and stand in the Himalayas and open my hair 
matted lock hair and you come and jump so that I can support your strength with which you will flow. And he does that. Ganga comes to the Himalayas and starts flowing. So as a child, I would be fascinated by these stories. So that kind of, and when years later, I did go to the Himalayas, I did go to the source of River Ganga, uh, and the trekking in the Himalayas, and you could actually see the, the it was just the, the vision right there, you would see the precipice, the, the glacier, the Gangotri glacier from which Ganga, Ganga emerges, you could say, wow, it could be Shiva's hair, right? So, so these connections, and then as a scientist, that's what my faith then connects is to try to find the answers. And the bottom line is, how can we provide 50 liters of fresh water to everyone who in the, on this planet? And that became my goal, is the connection to the faith. Thank you, Ramila, for sharing. Um, next, we have um, Sukhvinder. Um, I will show the first slide that you have. I will just share my screen for this. Sukhvinder had just an image to show. Um, and the panel is yours. Thank you. So for us, um, from a Sikhi perspective, um, you know, when I've gone and looked at our teachings, I mean, there's so many that over and over again talk about how water, like source itself, is part of water. It's part of land. It's part of air. Um, and, and so I'm not going to quote any particular teaching, but just to leave you with that, that source is a part of it, water itself. And so coming from that understanding, the reason I wanted to show the Kanda is I wanted to focus on, you know, how, how can we take action versus, you know, just the belief. So understand that source is a part of water. And then if you look at our six symbol here, you'll see the two swords on the bottom. Really, the base is made up of the three swords. The two swords at the bottom are Midi and Bidi. And Midi is how we show up and Bidi is about um, our belief system. So if we believe that source exists in water, then our actions have to be in alignment with that. And then the, the double-edged sword that goes through the center that's the one that, you know, helps us navigate the gray, the confusion, the fear, the uncertainties. So it's double edged so that, you know, when you go through the gray, you're able to cleave it and make it into black and white. Or maybe you're dealing with purple and you can make it blue and red. Right. So. And all of that is connected by the circle, which is source. Everything we do comes from source. All of us come from source. So therefore, all of us are connected to each and every one of us. And then that leads me to the three teachings that I want to share, um, because Sikhi is about, again, meaty beauty. It's all about um, how do you, what do you believe in? How do you show up? Both, you got to be balanced in both of those. And so Nam is simply, we're connected to source and everyone and everything. Jardikala, if you know when the going gets tough, you do expansive resilience. And Sarvatapala, we work for the well-being of all, and all includes everything, not just on this planet. I mean, we talk about galaxies and universes out there. We work for the well-being of all of us. So looking at these three teachings from a Sikhi perspective, we say these teachings twice a day minimum, and this is part of how we navigate. So if we're going to work on working on water, these help orientate us and help guide us so that when we're confused and hurt and frustrated and afraid, they're that North Star that guide us to be come back to center and go back to being our self-determined self. Thank you, Sukhvinder, for that, um, for sharing that with us. Um, we now have our breakout room discussion. So I just want to thank again um, our guest speakers for coming today. I'm going to give you a little round of applause on my end. Um, and if you have any questions for our presenters, you can ask them in the chat feature. There will be a Q&A session after the breakout room session. Um, Michelle, what, how many minutes are we going to be doing the breakout room session? We have about eight minutes for okay. the breakout room. And okay, Alice sounds is, good. Um, preparing that now. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So we'll bring, uh, we'll start the breakout room discussions with these two questions. And one word, what does your, what does water mean to you? And then the same question we asked our guest speakers, what does your respective religion, culture, or spiritual tradition teach you about the sacredness of water? And how can we connect more deeply with it to be better stewards of the environment? Um, so we'll send you out for about eight minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll kind of do a little debrief with the whole group to see what everyone talked about. 
Um, so I'm just gonna wait for Elisa's
Welcome back, everyone. That was the fastest eight minutes I think I've ever experienced. <laughs> We're having a fabulous conversation in my group. Um, and we have a, uh, a couple of minutes before we get into some Q&A with, um, with our panelists. Uh, wondering if there are any nuggets that anyone wants to share from their group. If you would go to reactions, it's the little smiley face on the bottom. Um, you click on that and you can click raise hand. And then it's easy for our um, Elise, who's our tech person this evening, to find you on the screen. What came out of your uh, conversation about water that you might like to share with us, with the larger group? Go ahead, Ramila. Um, yes, our group, I, I learned so much from them, even within eight minutes. Uh, so we had Len and, and Mariel, and she we, were, we are from different faiths, three of them from Catholic, I am from Hindu, and we decided one thing that connect us is water. So the kinship that water brings was something that that for me is a big thing. And also um, St. Francis of Assisi's concept of water as sister. And then uh, water as life, water as beauty, water as abundance. So those were some of the things that the words that that connected us all, no matter what our faiths are, where we come from, that was a big connector. So water connected us all. So that was uh, what we discussed. Thank you so much, Ramila. Craig? Hi, actually, this is Craig's wife, <laughs> Flora, <laughs> so you call it, uh, talking. Um, in our group, I, I mentioned to our group how we live in a small rural village west of Hamilton. And so as a result, of, because of our situation, we have to buy all of our water. So we're acutely aware of how precious it is and, you know, it, what... I guess you could call it a commodity, someone mentioned, but because of that awareness, um, you know, we, we realize, you know, how precious potable water is, you know, we have an abundance of water on the planet, but, but for drinking water, uh, it's not, you know, uh, just uh, communities in the north, but communities all over Canada, we have a, a, a lack of, of good water in many places. So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you so much for saying that. I have to say, I, I think my mouth just about fell open there when you said you're just a couple of hours outside of, uh, of Hamilton. Not shocking to me that you have to buy all of your water. I mean, I, I understand that it's an herb, uh, sorry, a rural area. Uh, but I still not just find that extraordinarily shocking. I think that that's, you know, something that a lot of people aren't aware of, that, yes. that many rural communities, you know, don't have the infrastructure for, for water. And so as a result, people like us, like we're very aware of water. And that's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I know there are some great organizations uh, that are doing work in rural communities to address these issues. And there are opportunities to get involved in, uh, in advocacy work as well across the country around uh, the issue of rural um, access to water. Anyone else have uh, something they would like to share? Gay Francis? Uh, we need you to unmute, please.
thought I had. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Uh, I mentioned in our group, along with the the comment that water is scarce in some places, that water can also be a threat. <clears throat> Pardon me. And with climate change and the rising sea levels and the melting ice caps, water can be pretty scary. And, that's, <clears throat> and I see my internet connection is unstable. I hope I'm coming through. Um, that it's uh, salt water, of course, is undrinkable. Um, and most of the water on the earth is salt water. Uh, hence the, the scramble for fresh water in various places. Thank you. Um, if there was anything you wanted to add, it might uh, be better to turn off your camera because I think you might be a little bit frozen. Okay. Um, I will uh, ask Marianne, as a, and that will be a great way to uh, segue into the, uh, whether if you have any questions for any of our panelists, if you would please raise your hand. And Elise, if you could uh, pin all of our panelists. Thank you. Go ahead, Marianne. Okay, thank you. Uh, so one of the words that we uh, came up with, it was just uh, two, two people in my, my room, uh, was that water is powerful. Mm. And um, we're coming to recognize that, right, with all of the, uh, the, the flooding and um, what happens in different countries where we see that flooding happening. Water is powerful, and uh, we can't control her. Whether we, you know, we like to think we can with the dams and uh, and all those uh, dikes, and but she's stronger than we are. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I also told uh, I I spoke with Carolyn about the the water the water walks and uh, how we begin our walks at the source and we walk down to the to the mouth. And that when the first year we did it. We did a recce, you know, we just checked out the route and uh, we looked at the source at the Grand River and there was a um, rusted lawnmower in the source, at the source. And so we know that the waterways are not tended to and loved. There's a lot of garbage in the water. And, and so uh, I talked about this uh, notion that we put things on the earth that is not good for the, for the water. It goes into the soil, all of our garbage, all of our plastic, all of our Tim Hortons cups, all of our cigarette butts, all, you know, they go into the earth and they dissolve and they go into the water system. You know, and uh, that, that basic scientific understanding, you know, the water, sky, earth, up into the sky, back down, you know, this is what, what happens. So, thank you. Thank you. I wonder, Marianne, are, are you planning any water walks this year? Uh, this year, actually, we're taking a break. We're taking our next water walk will be in the spring. We're walking for the Credit River in the spring, and then next fall, we're we're doing a prayer walk for the Grand River, for the dams, for the water behind the dams. Mm. We're going to be doing that in the in the fall. Okay. Yeah. This well, this year we're doing education. Yes. I'll be, going around, I'll be going around and speaking and raising awareness. Thank you. And we will definitely share more about that um, as you let us know what's on the schedule. We're happy okay. to share it through our network as well. Okay. Miigwech. Does anyone have uh, any questions for our panelists? Any other questions for our panelists? While you're all thinking, I'm going to um, ask, ask uh, oh, we've got Scott. Let's go to Scott first. Finish your thought if you like, though. Uh, actually, I can come back to it, but okay. it's okay. 
Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, my one of my questions is, I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, I appreciate everything you said, and I, I, I loved being part of the, the water ceremony with you on Sunday, Marianne. Um, it was a beautiful experience. And I'm wondering um, if you have some thoughts on uh, how men can be part of this, uh, like what, it, what are uh, some roles that we can play in this as uh, the ones who've, uh, well, I mean, if you look at me for one second, you can see I'm at the apex of privilege in so many ways. Um, what are some roles for people like me in, in the work that you're talking about in protecting the water? Thank you, Scott. I, um, as you know, we have our Grand River water walk or our walks and our ceremonies. And I'm just gonna to refer to our teachings about the responsibility of the men. And that is to protect the women. And when we do our water walks, the man walks next to the woman and the woman is carrying the pail with the water. And the whole idea of the water walk is to carry the pail from the source to the mouth in sa safely. And we just keep walking, we don't stop. And the idea that Josephine told, told us was that we don't stop because we, it's the understanding and the belief and the hope that water does not stop flowing. So that it keeps flowing in the earth. And so that when the men come and do that, they protect us while we're praying and carrying the water. As, as, our, as our role for, um, for the women. And what we're finding is we, we typically have a lot of women walking and we have a little scattering of men helping. And I think it's Josephine Ball would say, pick up the work, do your responsibility. The men are to, are to protect the women. So just come out and help us to do the work. Just be there, walk with us. Thank you, Marianne. I appreciate you speaking to um, the balance of the masculine and the feminine in protecting water. Thank you for asking that question, Scott. Anne? Uh, I guess I was struck by the comment in terms of um, Romila when you talked about climate and climate change that all climate is related to the movement of water. And I think of climate change and the problems, we often hear about carbon. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, this gave me a different perspective and another way to think about it. But all, cli all climate is all related to the movement of water. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Michelle, may I just add on to the question that Scott asked um, from a Sikh perspective? Sure. About the role of men. Um, in Sikhi, we actually don't, um, don't assign responsibilities based on gender. The responsibilities are everyone's responsibilities. And so um, I would invite you to look at it also from that perspective, right? Because so different traditions will have the responsibilities, but also just look at what's your role as a human being? That's it. How are you going to show up as a human? Mm -hmm. And if I may add um, on that as well, from the Hindu perspective, the, the concept of Ardhanarishwar is basically male, female being combined together. It's mm -hmm. half man, half woman is what makes a human being. So that in itself says, and what uh, Marianne said so beautifully, just be there right? Because your other half, we are joined together. Mm. Mm. It's one of the things that I think is so powerful about having these interfaith conversations is to um, uh, listen to the perspectives from um, di through different cultural lenses. Um, and uh, there, there's also the faith piece and then the piece that um, Sapvinder was bringing in around decolonizing our, uh, what I would sometimes call um, automatic uh, thinking or mm -hmm. automatic ways of looking at something. So thank you all for that. 
Um, I don't see any other hands raised and I see Shanit is looking at me probably saying we're over time. So <laughs> I'm going to pass it back to Shanit. Thank you all so very much for your time and your wisdom. Okay, so I'm just going to share my slides. I'll start the presentation if I can get this going. Okay, there you go. We just finished up with our Q&A session. And before we go, I just wanted to share some FCG resources with everyone. And uh, some of these are, uh, are in line with spring. So it's a perfect time to gear up for gardening and faith and calm and good can help. Perhaps you want to grow a vegetable garden or a flower garden in your backyard, or maybe you're looking for practical tips on topics such as water conservation, tree planting. Um, both the Native Plant Garden Guide and the Edible Community Guide can help with that. These are two resources that provide faith communities how to plan and maintain a successful native plant, vegetable, and herb garden. We've also partnered up with the Energy Star to release an action workbook for congregation. This workbook, this workbook is intended to serve as a planning guide for people who want to increase energy and water efficiency in their facilities by implementing cost-effective improvement projects. Um, this project helps you set energy and water and waste management saving goals and documents achievements along the way. And they are all free. And the last one we have um, is the Faith in the Environment Toolkit, which educates, empowers, and allows faith communities to take action on the sacred systems and resources that make up our environment. The uh, toolkit and focus us on um, water, biodiversity, and food waste. All these tools, as this tool helps build awareness about these issues, it is our hope that it will also facilitate and inspire actions that each one of us can take to do our part in preserving the sacredness of this planet. I will definitely be emailing you all these resources via email um, later this week as well. And I just wanted to say if you are ever interested in uh, future events, um, um, online or in person resources, um, I say we, you should. Please follow us on social media. We're always updating it on upcoming events. So um, whichever social media platform you are more comfortable with, um, there we are, we are in all five of those. And Michelle. Thank you. I want to take a moment to thank our speakers, Mary Ann, Ramilla, and Sukbinder. Thank you for taking the, uh, the time to be with us this afternoon, evening. Thank you for um, sharing your wisdom, your insights, your perspective. I wanna thank uh, Shanit for organizing this event for the Faith in the Common Good Network. Um, thanks to Elise for doing all the uh, work in the background here tonight. Thanks to Beatrice for uh, keeping us all um, uh, up to date in the chat. And of course, we're grateful to everyone who has joined us this evening. This is the second in a series of interfaith conversations. And in the follow-up email, when we send you uh, the resources, we will include a very brief survey to get some feedback from you about some of the topics that we could potentially um, explore this year. Our commitment is to continue to um, expand these conversations and uh, again, bring the uh, different lenses and continue to um, dismantle our biases over time. Um, and finally, if um, you feel called to do so, please consider making a one-time donation or becoming a monthly donor of our network. Thank you again, everyone. It's been a lovely evening, and I can't believe we're actually ending on time. <laughs> My thanks again to all of you for being here. Yes, you will receive the recording um, when the follow-up email goes out. I just saw that question in the chat.
Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much. You can unmute yourself and say goodbye as you're as you're leaving. Right. Have Maybe a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. 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 Good night. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Goodbye. The core team would just stay on here for a couple of minutes.